Thank you, Jermaine and Wendy. Um, please stand with us as we sing this next set of songs.
God has given us examples so that we can know what it looks like to be mature in our faith. And so this morning, um, I would like to look at one of those examples that we get from the Old Testament. It's not a perfect example of what faith looks like, but it is one that is noted throughout Scripture as a faithful example of what faithfulness looks like. So uh, as we look into Genesis chapter 12 and we look at the life of Abraham and God's calling of Abraham, we're going to see here the thing I want us to learn is to, to trust God through faithful obedience, to trust God through faithful obedience as we rely on him to bless us and others through us, all right? So to trust God through faithful obedience as we rely on him to bless us and to bless others through us. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 9. Okay, and you can see that on the screen, so that's good. I was concerned about that, but we're good, I think. Let me read here. It says this. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. So this is God's word to us. 
And so just so that we're clear here, uh, Abraham is the same person as Abram. Okay? He had his name changed a little bit later on in his faith, and Sarai is Sarah. So just to say that, and so I might use those names interchangeably at times where it says in the text, Abram, and I might say Abraham, because we know he has two names, right? <laughs> One name that's been modified. Does that make sense? Okay, so sometimes when you, we do stuff like that, we'll refer to somebody as uh, Kelly, and then we might refer to him as Kirby, you know, and it's the same guy that we're talking about. So you got it, okay? So uh, we're looking at Abram's life. I want to look at his life because as Steve read through Hebrews chapter 11, we see that he is an example of what it means to have genuine, authentic faith and what that faith looks like being worked out into life. So um, we want to look at his life and, and get some ideas for us um, into the new year. Can you see that on the screen there? It's okay? Okay, cause, good. I'm just making sure because the one behind looks a little bit different than the ones on the side, and I just wanted to make sure we're good. Now everyone can turn their heads and look back at the one behind you. You don't have to do that. Okay, so my first point here in looking at this is God calls man to believe him. God calls man to believe him. So when we look at Abram, uh, we, if we go through chapter 11, uh, we're seeing um, God, at, particularly in verse 27, we're seeing God kind of go through mankind, and we're seeing the, the establishment of people on the earth, and we're seeing God begin at this point in time to, to start to whittle that down in terms of deciding or seeing his plan being worked out through uh, Abram. And so it tells us that Abram's father's name was Terah, and we see that in Genesis chapter 11. And we see that Abraham and his father and, um, and his two brothers um, headed, it says in verse 27, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of Terah, of his father Terah, in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. So we see that here's where it starts from. This is where this family is, and Terah is the patriarch here. And he has these three sons, and one of his sons gets married and has a, a, another son, and then this person, this, this son dies, and so we have Lot, who would be Terah's grandson, right? So just not trying to get you all tripped in here, but the reason why we have this in Scripture here is because it's letting us know that this is how God's plan is beginning to work, and we want to get some background, a little bit of background on Abram, because he's going to be uh, the conduit, if you will, through which God's plan continues on, his plan of blessing uh, through, throughout, and the plan of redemption for mankind, and which is where this passage is so important for us, as we'll look into in just a few minutes. So it says here that um, in verse 29, Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren, and she had no child. So we're, we want to get that background there for us because it, it begins to help us to see what God is doing here uh, when he makes a promise to Abraham later on. And so uh, it says, uh, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there, and the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So if we look back in, uh, uh, on verse 26, which I didn't read back that far. It says, Terah had lived 70 years. When he had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Okay? So saying all of that here, it's going to help us to understand some of the things that we'll be reading as we, as we read into this passage. So I told you that um, God calls man to believe him. Okay? To believe him. When we talk about believing, we're talking about having faith in. If I told you something and you say, I believe you, you're going to say, yes, I believe in my head the facts that you're giving me, 
But if I tell you, eat a particular type of food and it'll make you healthy, it'll make you feel better if you're sick, if you believe me, you'll do that, right? No? Kind of? Yes? Yeah, you will. And so this is the idea of when we're talking about believing God, he wants us to believe him. He doesn't, uh, as he talks to Abraham here, it says, uh, the Lord said to Abram, as he speaks to Abram here in this passage, we don't know all about how it worked out. We find out a little bit later on that God appeared to Abraham as well, but we're not given a whole lot of facts. We just hear, we just know here that it tells us this is the divine voice speaking. The Lord said to Abram, He said, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So God, speaking to Abram here, challenges him or calls him to believe what God just told him. And so when we look at Abram, we recognize that he is a model, an example, I guess I should say, of of faith. He's the one, as Steve read in Hebrews chapter 11, who went out uh, going, not knowing where he was going. He's just trusting God. He's just believing God. It's a very simple faith in that regard. It's, It's a little bit more to it than that, but it's very simple in the fact that God said, go, and he went. So he calls man to believe. God called Abram to leave And what did he call him to leave? He said, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So he's called to leave. He was to leave his country, um, Ur of the Chaldeans, and in this particular context right here, Haran. If you go to Acts chapter 7, verses 3 and 4, you're going to see there when Stephen gives an account of the history of the Jewish people there, he talks about Abram being called before he's in Terah. I mean, Haran, excuse me, before he's in Haran. So we, we see here, uh, it tells us to leave, um, it says, leave your country and your kindred and your father's house. And this idea of kindred is spoken of earlier on in also in verse 28. It says, Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. So even though we're in Haran right now, we sense that there was this call that took place before when God had talked to Abraham and told him to leave his, the land of his kindred, which would be Ur of the Chaldeans. So he leaves with his, with his father, and, and they go, and they make it this far to Haran. So, so this is probably about 550 miles, they say, by way of the map, from where Ur of the Chaldeans is to where Haran is. And so they make this trip there, and God had called Abraham to go, and we find out he tells him to go into the land of Canaan, but Abraham with his father doesn't make it that far. They stop in Haran. And we don't know exactly why they stop there, but while they're there, they seem to, uh, Abraham seems to gather up some possessions and he seems to build up a little bit of wealth there. The way it reads here, if you look at the end of chapter 11, it seems like, oh, Terah dies and then Abram moves on from there. But, but if you look at the, the ages and everything, the way it's working, we find out Abram's 75 years old when he leaves to go into Canaan, we know that Terah says fathered Abram when he was 70 years old. So 70 and 75 makes 145. So we find out that Abram leaves this area where his father is. His father's 145 years old and lives to be 205 years old. So there's 60 more years of what's taking place here. We find out a little bit later on that, this, uh, that Terah uh, ends up dying. We, uh, or we know that he dies here 205 years. We find out the ages of how, you know, so just to kind of give us some, some 
some framework for what, what's happening here. It's not like Abram's being called to leave, uh, to leave a place where there's nothing there anyway. His father's dead, his family's gone, and so yeah, he's leaving some place he's going to start all over. That's not the call there. The call here is for him to leave his country, to go from where he is, to go someplace else, to leave his country, to leave his kindred, which would be kind of like his community. It's more than his family, but probably less than his tribe. To leave his community. Now, this guy's 75 years old. So you establish something when you've been around a place for a while. You get to know some people. You, they know who you are. See, if you walk around in this town and you've grown up here all your life, <clears throat> usually everybody knows you. It's kind of like the um, TV show Cheers, if you remember that. Everybody knows your name when you go there. And so that's what, what it's like. It's leaving everything behind. This is not just some little simple thing that, that God is calling him to do. It's something that's really big. And that's why when you think about Abram's faith, it's not just like, oh, well, he just kind of moseyed on and he started all over someplace else. He left his land. He left his community. It says he left his father's house to go to a land that God would show him. So when we talk about a father's house or a father's household, a man was identified as a member of this person's house, as a person's house. He would say, oh, I am Abraham of the house of Terah. And so when it means that he's identified with this person's house, and it, the way it reads, it seems like Abram's the firstborn as well. And so if he's going to leave his father's house, he's going to leave behind all of the property, all of the possessions that he would have a right to have as an heir. But God is calling him to leave all of that. And so he's, he, he's being challenged this way. And so when he calls him to do this, he says to leave, to go to a land that I will show you, he's also letting him know he's not saying exactly where he's going. He's saying, pack up your bags, get ready to go, and head into this land. And once you get there, I'll kind of show you where, where you're going to be settling down. Anyone want to go to Nevada and move there? It's kind of like that. Go there to Nevada. Go there and you'll be there. I, you know, Nevada, you know Reno and you know Las Vegas. But aside from that, there's really not much there. You know, it's pretty much desert. And if there's any people from Nevada watching, I apologize if I insulted you, okay? So here it is. God's calling him to do this. He's calling him to believe him. And so he called him to leave that. And he says, and to go to a place where I will show you. Verse 2 says, God called uh, Abram to go, and he said that I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. If you go back to chapter 11 at the beginning there, you see when they're going to make the Tower of Babel, those guys are there because their desire is to make a great name for themselves. So Abraham is... is set up against these people to see that he's not out to try to make a great name for himself. This is God wanting to do this to his people, to this particular man. And so when we think about him, he's, he's leaving everything he has because he is trusting God. He is believing God. And so when we think about ourselves, where are we? I mean, where is our identity found? Are we rooted in this community and this is where our identity is? And so we can't ever think about leaving here? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not inviting you to go somewhere. I'm just saying I think the fact is that we always need to have that sort of mindset that God has right in my life, the right in my life to do whatever he wants and that means to place me wherever he'd have me. I remember when we were... Um, contemplating going into seminary, and I remember talking to Jermaine about it, you know, and she, she was not interested in going initially. She was like, why would God do that? I mean, I didn't tell her he called me to do this. Uh, I heard a voice like Abram or anything like that. I said, 
you know, there's a lot of restlessness in me. There's this desire to do this. It was something that he put there in the past, and it's not something that's gone away. And so, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you think? And she says, well, why would God do that? Why would he move us from my family and your family and everything to kind of bring us into Texas of all places, you know? And after 15 months of praying, by me, not her, God changed her heart. I don't know. Um, I think sometimes we have our dreams, and our dreams are all locked up into where we are. Um, our identities here, maybe our occupational dreams are here too. The question is, is that what God has for you? And are you willing to even open your mind to the possibility that it might be something different if that's what he should call you to do or lead you on in that area, I guess I should say. So God tells Abraham, you're going to leave, and I want you to go. And, and where you go, he says, I'll, I'll, I'll make you, verse 2, is I will make of you a great nation, and, and, and I will uh, bless you and uh, make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So God promise, promises to make uh, a great nation of Abram. At the time, he doesn't have any children. We just found out his wife is barren. And so he's really like going with, what, what do you got in mind? The fact that he has Lot with him, Lot is his nephew, and it kind of seems like that's maybe like Abram's adopted son in a way, you know? Lot seems to hang with him until a little bit later on we get in the story here. We find out that he wants to go his own way. But, but you see this is, you know, there's this connection there, and Abram's like maybe thinking like that, maybe it's going to come through Lot, we don't know. But he didn't have any offspring of his own. He didn't have any children of his own. That's why the, the promise is such a big deal, too. It's somebody who doesn't have their own kids. Like God told me, I, I, if I had 25 kids, and he said, I'm going to make a great nation of you, I'd say, you, you already got started, didn't you? you know? But this guy doesn't have anybody, okay? He says, you know, uh, I, I will bless you and I'm going to make your name great. So God is going to make a great name for Abram. And it says, so that you will in turn be a blessing. And this is just kind of a, a, an aside, but it is a principle of how God seems to work. When he blesses us with anything, he desires for us to be a blessing to others with that. And I'm not just talking about material things. I'm talking about whatever it is. If you think about the, the idea of spiritual gifts within the church, he gives gifts for the building up of the church. So if you're gifted in a particular area, the way that God you know, talks about spiritual gifts, that's for the purpose of what? To build up the church. It's to be a blessing to others around. It's not just to hold and hoard for yourself and say, oh, I'm just going to do this. And so that's a hard thing to do. Because when you want to use your gift, it's great. But when you don't, or you rather not, or you think that maybe people are not so appreciative of you, kind of say, oh, maybe I'll just kind of hold back here a little bit. That's not the way it's supposed to be. So God wants to bless Abram, and he says, you know, so that you will be a blessing. He says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So now he's just expanding it big time. To you, all the families, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. So he's making this promise to, to Abraham. He later on reiterates the same promise to Isaac and to Jacob. And so you're seeing God's promise of blessing start with Abraham and begin to go through his family. And it's the promise, it's the faithfulness of God to continue what he started in the past. And it doesn't just stop because Abraham's not around. It goes on to Isaac. It goes on to Jacob. You know, it's kind of interesting. I think about this because, you know, as, as uh, you know, I, I, I read a little bit of the politics stuff, you know. And so our, our current president, President Trump, you know, he has certain things that he's doing. And so they say, well, President Trump did this or President Trump did this. President Trump represents all of us, right? I mean, as our, as our president, it's what we, the United States, have done. But it seems like there seems to be some sort of separation in there in the way that the news is being reported that it's President Trump who did this and it wasn't the United States military or the U.S. government. You know, granted, he's the one who made the decisions there for certain things that happened, but we as a people, 
are, are part of that, right? And so when you think about policies and how they say, well, this president made this policy, but now there's another president, I'm not saying they can't change things there, but you can't just start to say, well, we deal with the individual and we never deal with the, the country as a whole. You know, we don't see it that way. You know, that's one of the things that happens in churches. A new pastor comes in, and he wants to make some changes. He said, well, that's different than the old pastor. This old pastor did this way. So the one good thing about a, a church that has strong leadership aside from their pastor is that they tend to continue on in the same areas that, they begun, that they've begun in because God continues to work through that. Instead of like, boom, we got this pastor, we did all this stuff, boom, now the pastor's gone, we get another pastor, now we changed completely our focus of ministry, and we went someplace else. And I'm not saying that it can't change if it needs to. I'm just like saying, if you get a, you know, you, you talk about churches and instability in their leadership, they got a pastor that's there for two years, and then the next pastor comes for two years, and the next pastor comes for two years, you don't know who you are after a while if, if that's how your church is, is, is identified, right? You know, it's the God who is at work. And so we're just thinking about this here. You know, these blessings that Abraham are continuing on through him, through his offspring, so that in Jesus Christ we understand as the New Testament unfolds, we see that Jesus Christ is this conduit, a fountainhead of blessing to all mankind. Why? What does Jesus bring? Jesus brings the offer of forgiveness. Jesus brings the offer of salvation. Why do we need to be forgiven of our sins? Why does God want that for us? Because God wants to enjoy relationship with us, and sin is separating us from him. That's why it's called reconciliation. It's not just to save us so that we can be smiled and happy and satisfied and on our way to heaven. It's for the idea, the purpose of fellowshipping with God. And so when we take care of the big problem of sin, we're open to be able to be in right relationship with God. That's a blessing, isn't it? Have you ever tried to be in a relationship with someone who didn't want to be in a relationship with you? I remember I liked this girl before, you know? And she did not return my affections. I was heartbroken. Why? What about me, you know? What's wrong with me? Right? It's not a good feeling to feel like somebody doesn't want you and you really want that person. How would it be if God didn't want us? See, he's benevolent. We are blessed there. So when we think about this here, we're thinking about God calling mankind, calling man to believe him. And it's a very uh, simple thing. And God called Abraham to leave and to go, and he called him to believe him, to trust him for what God promised. He calls everybody he commands everybody. This is not an option about whether you feel it or not. He commands everyone to believe in his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's command. Did you know that? Everyone. And we want to win people over with the truth of the gospel. We want to win them over to see the blessings of what it looks like to walk in faith with God and to see the peace, the joy, the love that is in this community here so that people will be attracted to God. But you know what? If, even if it's not attractive, God commands people to believe in his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. Go look it up if you don't believe me. It's a command. It's not an option. So when we say that people make their own choices, they do. That's, that's right. But it's still not right that they make the, right, the wrong choice. Okay? So we want to keep on persisting and sharing the gospel as much as we can so that people will be in right relationship with God. Okay? So Abraham believed God. He left and he went. It's going to tell us here in verse 4. But God commanded him to believe him, right? And so uh, that's called faith in God. Right? We call that faith in God. 
Do you agree with me or no? Are you awake? The game doesn't start for another 15 minutes. I'll be out of here real fast, okay? Okay, it's called faith in God. But let's look at faith in God a little bit. Faith in God is demonstrated by obeying him. Jesus told his disciples, if you love me, you will do what I say. If we believe God, we will do what he says. We will obey him. So faith in God is demonstrated by obeying him. So verse 4 says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So we see the age thing happening there. We see he's 75 years old. Uh, like I told you before, his father was 145 at this time. And so he's leaving him. And the thing about it, Terah is not just dying right away. He's going to be alive for another 60 years as we run through the account of Abram's life. And Abraham doesn't go back there to try to get some blessing and say, you know, I come back to reclaim the property and the rights that I have as a firstborn child or anything like that. Nope. You're seeing God establish him as this fountainhead of blessing to the rest of the world here. So Abram went as God told him. And he went and he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarah and his wife, verse 5, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So Abraham goes, he takes all that he has, and he leaves. Uh, we know that Sarah's 10 years younger than Abraham. We find this out a little bit later on. Abraham says, I'm 100, and Sarah's 90, and we're going to have a child. So we know that she's 10 years younger than he is, or thereabouts, very close, if not exactly 10. 10 years younger than him, so she's 65 when they leave. So when Abram got there... He goes to this place, he gets into Canaan, and he goes to this place, Shechem. Interesting, verse 6 says, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Shechem. Right? To the place at Shechem. What place? It's a place of worship. Shechem would be th this place at Shechem. It says there's an oak tree there, an oak or a terebinth tree of more. More means teacher. So you have this tree of where teaching takes place. Trees were used in that part of the land, uh, part of the, of the world because they cast shade and it's very hot there when the sun is shining. There's a place to gather underneath the tree and to get some shade. And this particular tree was noted for a place where some sort of divine teaching would take place. It's the oak or the terebinth of Mora, that place. And so he goes there expecting, hey, if this is a place where God is, if this is a place where God has told me to go and I'm in this land, then I'm going to go there and see where God is. I'm going to go in there and, and hear from God while I'm there. I'm following him. He's looking still. And so as he gets there, it says that uh, he went to this place, he, 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 he's there, and then it tells us at the end of verse 6, at the time, the Canaanites were in the land. So God's promised it to Abram, but there's still these people there. So there's some sort of tension there as, the, as it unfolds, God, what God is doing, his plan, that... It's not happening just exactly the way we thought it would be. Don't you think since God promised you, just go there and walk in and show up, and there it is. You got your promised land. He goes there, and it says there's these Canaanites there. So the Canaanites are in the land. And so um, what does Abram do? It says, uh, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So God appears to him right there. He's looking for God. He can't see how it's happening with the Canaanites there. But we see he's humble enough to keep on, you know, to, to pursue what God had given to him in obedience. And it said, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. Which takes us into our, our, our last point. So we're talking about faith now. We're talking about faith being demonstrated by obeying God. Now we're talking about faith 
in God is demonstrated by worshiping him. So this is one thing that's really interesting. We live in a society now where people feel like I can have my own private faith. I can have my truth, and you can have your truth, and such and such can have their truth, and so and so can have their truth. And so we all can have our own truth. And so I have my truth, and you have your truth. And so I don't need to go to church to be with a body of believers, to practice the one another's. I can just have my own private faith. And I think the reason why we talk about worship, yes, you can have private worship, but throughout the scriptures, you're talking about worship really being in the setting of a community. It's a place where it's public. It's a place where people come and gather together and you worship together. It's not just out on your own doing your own little thing here. And so we want to think about that. We want to talk about worshiping God because that's what our faith in God says. We're going to be obedient to him in this way. Remember Jesus told the woman at the well in John chapter 4 that God is looking for true worshipers? God is looking for true worshipers. And those who are true worshipers are those who worship in spirit and in truth. So as those who have faith in God, we want to worship him. That's part of our faith in God. It's demonstrated in worship. Abram does this. It says, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to to your offspring, I will give this land. And so he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. When you think about building an altar, if you think about the reverse, if you read in the Kings there, and if you think about Ahab and his wife Jezebel, she brings in and introduces some different worship into the land, and that worship is introduced by altars being built to these other gods. What Abram's doing right here is he's introducing the worship of the one true God, The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, also known as Yahweh. And he's introducing worship into this land here. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham, so he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And then because there's Canaanites in the land, even though God says, God tells him, the Lord appeared to him, to your offspring, I will give this land, he builds an altar to say this belongs to God. This is the land God's promised me. I'm going to build an altar because this is where worship is going to take place to the one true God. Verse 8 says, From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So he heads south from this Shechem and he goes to this place. And then he ends up from there. It says Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. He pitches his tent there. And there, what does he do? And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. See, this is one of the things that identifies us as true believers. If someone says, I believe in God, and they are calling on God for anything, you kind of wonder what's going on inside them. Because if you're a true believer, you know that you need God. And so, of course, you would call upon the name of the Lord. Because you need him. And this is what Abram does here. It says, he called upon the name of the Lord. So he's, there's the establishment of worship there. He sets on there. And then in verse 9, it says, And Abram journeyed on still going toward the Negev, which would be into the south. And so as he, as he journeys this way, this is how this little beginning ends here. This narrative is talking about Abram going in. He's being faithful. He's, he's doing what God asked him to do. He's believing God. He's demonstrating that through obedience. He believes God. He demonstrates that through his worship. He moves on because, as we saw in verse, the end of verse 6, there's Canaanites in the land. He's moving on now, and he's moving south to try to, 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 to get away from all of that, if you will, and and as he does that, he's journeying on to, to, this, to this southern place here. And it just stops there, and it's going to pick up. I intend to go through the life of Abraham a little bit, intend to pick up 
uh, a little bit on, on this next time. But then the thing is here, so not to make it too difficult for us, because we know Abram is an example of faith. And so when we think about it for ourselves, we say, well, what am I supposed to learn from this? Am I supposed to wait till I hear a voice from God and then leave everything I, I have and I know and go somewhere else? That's what I'm going to wait to do. And you know, sometimes when we're looking for direction and you want to do something and you want to find your leading in the Bible, I, my suggestion to you isn't just to go to Genesis chapter 12 and start reading that passage. It's not to do that because then it will just reinforce what you want to do anyway. And I'm not sure if that's what God wants for you to do. I think you should seek the Lord first in all of these things. But the idea is, are we supposed to be just like Abraham in this way? And I say just like, I think the idea is that we're supposed to follow after God. Uh, First of all, have you placed your trust in God? In this way, that you're saying, I believe God, I'm depending upon him, I'm going to demonstrate my faith and obedience to him because I believe him, because I'm saved already, not to get saved, right? So do you have faith in Jesus Christ? See, because God commands us to believe him through his son, Jesus, now. So the question is, is, have you placed your trust in God through Jesus Christ? That's the simple. That's the beginning, right? The next one is if God is call, if God were to call you out of your comfort zone like he did Abram, what would your response be? Would you be like we were at first? I talked about Jermaine. What could God possibly want by moving me away from my family? And my people, every place, everything that I know from this geographical area where everybody knows my name. If you were to call you out of your comfort zone, how would you respond? See, the thing is, it's not that we have to go and do something fantastic or great in the sense we have to leave and go somewhere. It's the idea is, are we willing, instead of go to a country, you know, thousands of miles away, Are we willing to go across the street to our neighbor's house and say hi? You know, are we willing to do that? Because if we're not, it doesn't matter about all this other stuff. You know, I'm going to really, you know, go and do something fantastic for God. It starts with the little things. And so the question is, how are you going to respond to God? I think what God wants us to do, and he always wants us to do, is to trust him, and through our faith and faithful obedience, to rely on him, to provide, to bless us with whatever, and then to trust him to bless others through us. So we know that he can bless us. The question is, do we know that he can bless others through us, and are we willing to let him do that? The only way you're ever going to find that out is if you... If you let him, if you let him, if you trust him for that, if you say, Lord, I want to be a blessing in such and such's life, Lord, I want to be a blessing to so-and-so, I want to be able to reach out to them, I want to be able to share the good news with them. Because we know in Jesus Christ, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. We have the blessing of comfort, we have the blessing of forgiveness, we have the blessing of reconciliation, we have the blessing of spiritual gifts as a believer, each one of us gets a gift, at least one, to be used in building up the body. So we know that we're blessed. The question is, do we believe that God can bless others through us? So trust him. 